I love you guys. Four simple words that have a greater meaning in Colorado. It was a text from Emily Keyes to her parents before she was killed by an intruder at Platte Canyon High School in 2006. The state just got a bad grade for how it tracks the money it spends on school safety. Legislators just heard from Emily's father. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. How is the state of Colorado handling school safety? Well, an audit released this week found we can't measure it, despite more than $100 million put aside for school safety programs between 2018 and 2020 on tips, training, school improvements, emergency response, and behavioral health. If we are going to spend another dollar on school safety, we are going to have to be able to evaluate the outcomes. Representative Daphna michelson Janay is the chair of the School Safety Committee, which today came up with a dozen potential bills to start drafting for next year, ultimately to make students and teachers safer. My wife and I started the I Love You Guys Foundation. As it considers spending more money on school safety, the committee heard from John Michael Keyes this afternoon, Emily Keyes' dad. Today, in Colorado, we've got 1,500 of the 1,800 and change schools using this program. The budget for the I Love You Guys Foundation this year, $700,000. Its standard response protocol is used by more than 30,000 schools in North America. So should Colorado mandate the foundation's protocol? The tough thing about mandates is these practices change. And one of the things that I'd like to see is kind of based on the Indiana model. And in Indiana, what the state legislated was that every school has a school safety specialist. On a $700,000 budget annually, they are having a greater impact on this issue perhaps than anything else that's going on out there. One idea to come out of this committee is a coordinating body to improve communication between the different state agencies that deal with school safety. In some places, they call that a specialist. We have to be able to account for the money we're spending, and we need to know that that money we're spending is saving lives, period. Go figure, a private group spending $700,000 is doing better than a government spending $100 million. Uh, some of the ideas to come out of this today, Steve, uh, improvements to safe to tell, uh, mental health first aid for educators, and the idea of having excused absences for mental and behavioral health days, which I know a lot of companies are talking about that as well. Yeah, and the one thing in the list that we're not hearing about is, is the gun issue. There was guns brought up as part of school safety, the idea of uh, safe storage at home and, and legislating how guns should be stored at home so that they don't get involved into the school environment. They did not deal with that in this committee. They heard about it, but if that's going to be legislated, that'll be a different committee at the Capitol sometime next year. And the thought is all of these things we may see down the road at the Capitol. They talked in the summertime to present it starting in January. All right. Marshall, thank you. Nearly a month after Downing was repaved at Spear, the crosswalk at the intersection has finally been repainted. Three days ago, we spoke with Jonathan Rose, a man who walks through that intersection during rush hour twice a day to get to and from work. He captured video of cars blowing through the intersection, failing to yield to pedestrians. The city said it was behind, but expedited the work after we took Rose's concern to public works. Some cities in the metro area are going to try timing their traffic lights by tracking drivers. They don't have to put a GPS on your car because you already have one of those. To the disgruntled driver on their daily commute, it seems the traffic light never changes fast enough. Computers could change that. Probably 5% of the signals in the metro area are, are running adaptive today. Jeremy Hannock is the director of public works for Greenwood Village. GV is about to make Yosemite Street run adaptive, which essentially means gather data about the flow of traffic and let computers adjust the signals in real time. They do it using cameras at intersections, and then these little boxes that essentially read Bluetooth signals from anything from your phone to your car to any other device you might have on you. When it reads it at one intersection, it can timestamp it. And then when it reads it at the next intersection, we get a sense of how well traffic's flowing along a corridor. Fascinating. And in something of a first for the metro area, three cities are about to work together to improve the flow of one street. On Yosemite Street, you go between Greenwood Village, Centennial, and Lone Tree in a blink of an eye. One blink later. And it will allow our signals to adjust in real time to deal with that traffic as it exists. Lone Tree Public Works Director Justin Schmitz told us it'll be much better than the way the lights used to work. The signals are coordinated together. 
Um, that means as you drive, right, you should get as many green lights as you can. When this change happens, probably early next year, they say you will notice the difference. No matter if you're in Lone Tree or Centennial or in Greenwood Village, travel along Yosemite Corridor, you're going to see improvements. So why aren't they rolling this out until after the holidays, you ask? Because Yosemite writes, runs right next to Park Meadows Mall. Probably not the best time to experiment with traffic. So if this works, you could see this spread throughout other parts of that north-south corridor between those three cities. Greenwood Village says they've seen a 30% increase in travel times in areas where they've tested this out. Our next question comes from a viewer who goes by R. Baca. He wants to know how proceeds from parking fees at DIA are spent and who gets to decide that. Well, Mr. Baca, this is actually something our Marshall Zellinger has recently touched on. He was looking into how DIA pays for construction projects when he learned what the parking fees pay for. That money pays parking expenses. Anything left over goes to projects like the Great Hall. Those parking expenses include upkeep of the parking lots, bus and shuttle services to the lots, and upcoming tech upgrades like an express pay system. The airport CEO and CFO decide on how to spend the airport's budget. It gets approved by the mayor and the city council, just like other city departments. And now you know. When it comes to debating the health effects of recreational marijuana, every side of the debate uses science to their advantage, even the sides that don't agree. At least that's what we found when it came to dissecting the impacts of marijuana getting stronger. Here's our Anusha Roy. Over the years, the potency of marijuana has been steadily going up. You know, back in the 80s, uh, potency, levels, potency levels were somewhere around 3 to 5 percent. And now uh, we're looking at potency levels right around 25, 30 percent. In some cases, the DEA said it was as high as 90 percent and that science shows those higher levels can be dangerous. Those levels, I mean, it's, it's highly addictive, uh, it's psychoactive. While their work focuses mostly on the black market, these federal investigators say organized crime groups saw an opportunity in Colorado, in part because of state laws. Uh, it's not illegal to do it. In Colorado, there are no potency limits for retail flowers or concentrates, but there are some limits for edibles. What you get out of the Department of Health statement depends on how you look at it. They say said currently there is little to no evidence about specific health effects of marijuana potency, but did warn they don't know how safe dabbing is and that some extracts and concentrates can have as much as 80 percent THC. Well, there's really no evidence that suggests that uh, the percentage of THC is, you know, is a factor in any of these kinds of health concerns. Aaron Smith with the National Cannabis Industry Association also brought up science, saying it doesn't back up blaming THC and that other factors could be involved in people falling sick. So instead of focusing on percentages, he said focus on regulations that eliminate surprises. What's important is that uh, cannabis products are labeled, uh, tested for potency and labeled. Uh, so that consumers know what, what they're purchasing. And that only can happen in a legal market. The one universal symbol we did find was this one the state shared that shows up on legitimate pot products and is easy to understand. For next, I'm Anusha Roy. So we also talked to Denver police who say that they are seeing or they're used to seeing stronger marijuana these days, but they did say they feel like dispensaries are doing a better job of educating people about what they're buying and people buying pot have learned more since legalization. So we thought we had a Senate candidate snag a record for the shortest Senate campaign after Denise Burgess abandoned hers after only four days. But that appears to go to former Senator Mark Udall. Now, the former spokesperson for the Secretary of State's office and political reporter, Lynn Bartles, gave us a quick history lesson on Twitter. She told us Democrat Mark Udall once ran a one-day campaign for Senate back in 2004. He dropped out after Ken Salazar jumped in. Well, he's only been in Colorado for 24 hours, but this guy's been pretty active. Today, he took part in the climate change protest in downtown Denver. Last night, he held a town hall in Aurora. But since the Democratic presidential candidate has been in our state, we've been asked about the correct way to pronounce O'Rourke's first name. So we thought we'd make that tonight's What Do You Say? Let's get to it. Please welcome my friend, Beto O'Rourke. <laughs> That's Beto O'Rourke from Texas. He'll be sharing center stage. There you have it, Beto. By the way, that's his longtime nickname. His real name is Robert. RTD didn't want to give up a whole lot of nothing for a new park to honor Medal of Honor recipients. One board director says there's already a better place to do that right across the street. 
I'm not sure a lot of people know about its existence here. We look into the Colorado Veterans Monument and a special statue sitting nearby. It's a sign that in one Colorado neighborhood, you better watch your speed on wheels and horseback. Next. It's a sign that you gotta slow down for more than school zones in this part of town. Our viewers, David and Vanessa, saw this on a road outside of LaSalle. There are two options here. This is either a speed limit sign for drivers warning about how horseback riding in the area, or it's a speed limit sign for horseback riders who are just going way too fast. We will let you decide what signs made you laugh today. Email next at 9news.com or email or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. miles per hour on a horse. Can you imagine? Hey, you know what? This afternoon into this evening, our biggest threat for seeing some crazy weather out there is going to be our red flag warning. Still in place around Denver to the south of Palmer Divide and across the western slope. High fire danger will continue through about 8 p.m. tonight. We already have a couple of fires burning up in the foothills. Some really strong winds, so if you do see any more sparks, they could potentially spread fast. 20 to 30 mile per hour wind gusts coming out toward DIA and then stronger wind speeds uh, coming their way across the eastern plains. Just a couple of ice little storms firing up in Larimer County, up in the high country, tracking up in and around Wyoming, where we do have a severe thunderstorm watch in place. But once this cold front that's kind of stirring up all the winds and the wild weather, once that pushes out overnight, that means a cool evening and a clear night. Overnight lows in the 40s here for the metro area, 29 in Leadville with 30s going in and around the northern mountains. They do have a freeze watch in place out there. By 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, plenty of sunshine. That's the way the entire day goes till later in the afternoon into the evening when we have a few more clouds out there and the possibility of one or two isolated showers or thunderstorms back behind this front. Cooler air. Bring it on, right? 75 on tap tomorrow. We stay in the 70s across the northeastern plains with 50s and 60s going way up high. We'll keep it seasonal around 78 on Sunday. First day of fall, a little warmer. And then, Steve, heading toward the end of next week, a bigger cool off and a possibility of a bit more rain around here. That sounds like fall. Thank you, Danielle. Yes. Well, earlier this week, we asked our viewers if you could radically change Colorado by doing one thing, what would it be? A few people told us they would make marijuana illegal again. Someone said make I-70 a toll road. Well, yesterday we spoke with two Coloradans who see the state a little differently than most. They're photographers who constantly look for ways to find Colorado's beauty. So we asked them, what's one thing they would change? We would have a longer warm season and a cooler, I mean a shorter cool season. So while I appreciate the snow and the skiing opportunities, I, I thrive when it's warm, when it's hot outside. Man, if I could change something about Colorado, uh, uh, less, less, uh, less, less craft breweries. <laughs> less craft breweries popping around and uh, more uh, historical designations, I think to, to spots that, to, you know, locations here in Denver that deserve it. RTD created quite a firestorm after one board director questioned why Denver would need a Medal of Honor museum. It led to another board director pointing out a monument that some people didn't know existed. It means different things to a lot of different people. For those of us who are in Vietnam, it means Vietnam. We find the Vietnam veteran who played a key role in getting it built. Next.
An RTD board director hit a nerve with the Denver community this week after she questioned if there were enough Medal of Honor recipients to warrant building a museum in their honor here. Now, Denver and Arlington are in the running for that museum. She was one of the seven who voted against giving the museum a lot to create a park for that museum. So another director asked, why not use a park nearby? The fact is there's a park right across the street that is dedicated to veterans. It is four to five times the size of our dirt lot covered by gravel. Natalie Menton wanted to know how many people actually knew that the park with the Colorado Veterans Monument is there. There are a few people within our newsroom who didn't know about it. So it's actually been there for nearly 30 years. So we went out and found the Vietnam veteran who helped get that monument built. The name of the monument is the Colorado Veterans Monument, and it's to the men and women who served and sacrificed in our nation's armed forces. It was about Vietnam, but it was built for the past, the present, and the future. That's why we built it. My name's Tim Drago. I'm a Vietnam veteran, 50 years ago, Central Highland. We're in Lincoln Park, which is right across from the state capitol. And in Lincoln Park, you have the Colorado Veterans Monument, of which I'm the founder. And it was dedicated on Veterans Day, 1990. I think it's important that we recognize the men and women who serve our country and make it great. And this was important to us, because what it meant is somebody at the state capitol cared enough to build it. It worked out great. This is the uh, beacon, and for a time it went dark, but we got it fixed, and it'll be there uh, every evening for long after I'm gone. <laughs> My hope for the future is that the National Medal of Honor Museum is built and located across from the state capitol and the Colorado Veterans Monument. Building the monument made my day. Having that across the street would even add more emphasis to it. And that would really be great. It really would. Now, not far from the Colorado Veterans Monument sits a statue honoring Colorado's first Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, Private Joe P. Martinez. Private Martinez, who entered the service in Alt, Colorado, was the first to receive the military's highest honor for his heroic actions during World War II. He inspired other troops to advance on enemy soldiers while under heavy fire on snow-covered mountains in May of 1943. Well, this may be the most Colorado crash we've ever seen. Thankfully, it sounds like everyone's okay. We'll take you there next. most Colorado thing we saw today is a Subaru pileup on the way to DIA. A car stopped suddenly in the front there. Not one, not two, but three Subaru drivers were following a little bit too closely and got caught in the lineup. So Denver police told us that some of the drivers complained of some minor injuries, but no one was seriously hurt. Those drivers will probably leave a little space next time they're behind the wheel. What's the most Colorado thing you saw? Share it with us. Send it to next at 9news.com or you can use the hashtag HeyNext. We did get a question from a viewer on Twitter asking for an update on that fire that's burning in Jefferson County right now. There's a live look. This is in the Clear Creek Canyon area. It, we've learned it's now 15 acres. Eight agencies are fighting it. And keep in mind, Highway 6 is closed from Highway 93 to Highway 119. We'll continue to update that throughout the night here on 9 News and on the networks of 9 News. In the meantime, see you next time.